Greetings, comrades, and welcome to the Eastern Border. I, uh, to be honest, haven't slept until the last recording, because it's just been too much information going on for me. So, sorry if this sounds a bit weird once again. My teeth are feeling much better now, though, which is nice. And secondly, I have switched to a backup microphone, because apparently either my... Well, mic that I've been using for 40 years, which is Thai Studio 150, has given out the ghost... Or it's the USB port, and, uh, well, switch to backup until I get a new main microphone. And, uh, well, we're gonna get a new new main microphone very soon, when I come back from the United States. About that a bit later. But, um, but yeah, things been going on, and been really hot, and it's been an especially difficult day for me, doing all these, all these things, and covering all the situation. It's been a bit of a bit of a weird mess of of our last twenty four hours, really, because we have some heavy news, and we have some bizarre news, and then we have frontline news, and this time I will I will leave the frontline news at the end because I just listened to two hours of Igor Girkin and his pals, and then I looked at the Ukrainian side and all that stuff, but. We have some heavy stuff going on there. And the first part I want to start it with is the fact that, well, on the Russian side, if, if you know about the assaults, uh, which you should if you're listening to this episode, I mean, you probably listened to the previous ones as well. Basically, what happened was that a Russian soldier posted online a video where, um, where he castrates a Ukrainian prisoner of war while the prisoner of war is still alive and then in a in the next kind of future video shoots him in the head and kills him and and then as if this wasn't enough because recently there was um, an opinion piece in one of the big media sites about how um the Russian, Russian side is using their artillery about how anti artillery defense and anti air defense is needed. Well, a prisoner of war camp blew up in a, a site called Yelenovka, which Russians have been controlling since forever, and everyone knew it was a prisoner site, and people have died there, Ukrainian the prisoners of war. And the Russian Federation claims that this is because of high Mars missiles, which is a lie. But we have, well, wartranslator.com has. I've also seen similar reports from my people, but I'll get to my people later. The reports that this most likely looks like an internal explosion, not high Mars missiles or anything like that. But um, but yeah, after after um, after the Russian side heard that the West is going to increase their uh, deliveries of heavy weapons, they basically themselves blew up a site uh, full with Ukrainian prisoners of war. And then Yenis Pushilian, the head of the Donetsk region, claimed that this is this is Ukrainian side blowing up Azov defenders of Mariupol because they've started to speak. Let me remind you that those people are undergoing Soviet prison torture and uh, that's a heavy that's, that's some heavy stuff. You should check out my older episodes for that. But about the current current stuff, I mean, the guy who um, who castrated the Ukrainian soldier and killed him, and spread this on the video, yeah. Uh, well, if you remember that I have some friends from my earlier episodes. Well, some call them friends, some call them legitimate businessmen, some call them um, distant cousins. You know, I have some friends. And um, they were they are super interested into this situation, so they promised me hundred euros for uh, any clue about the guy's ID. And although Georgian Legion from the NAFO and everything, they are evaluating their options and they claim that they know who this guy is. The data, as far as I know, comes from computer data, comes from neural networks, and comes from bots. And as this guy is from Buryatia and is more Asian than white, well, this data is incorrect. And um, as my friends, legitimate businessmen, are very inventive, then, you know, they before they start to misbehave again, um, 
they would like to be precisely exactly sure that the guilty party, well, gets some fun entertainment at home or for the rest of his life, however long that may be. Um, but you know what I'm talking about. So uh, I am I am instructed to tell you that if you are there in a Russian call center, and I know that you guys are there, then uh, 100 euros straight up your bank account. If you have any info about the guy in the castration video who committed these acts, then, um, hey, let Eastern Border know. I'm just an info broker. I have no clue about what my friends are doing. They just asked me to tell you this, and I am. Secondly, uh, about the Charity Act. Yeah, we're doing this. We're doing this, and I've been in contact with the Latvian embassy in Ukraine, and uh, Edvins, the guy who literally helped me out while I was there, uh, has contacted people. And what we need to do is that we're going to have the whole August to gather funds for a DJI Mattress 300 drone. That's in the ideal scenario. They have like cheaper drones as well. So far we have, well, 500 euros from me, 500 euros from, by this point, two of my listeners and a bit more thrown in from other listeners. So we have about 2,000 euros. The goal is 10,000 euros. If we're going to reach less, we're going to give to some other charity. But throughout August, we'll be doing this fundraiser because we need to buy them a, we need to buy them this drone. And, of course, with all the data, and you, you'll you have photos of the drone and all the documentation, it, it's super clear. It's just that they're going to use the money to buy the drone anyways. And it's easier for me, when I go back to Ukraine, to just, you know, get the drone, and then just go and deliver to, it to them in person, which can then be, you know, also documented and filmed. We're going to have our own unit of Ukrainian army that we can take care of. After the previous events, I think that's... Uh, that's a noble cause. And if this fails, of course, we're going to do some other Ukrainian charity. The ComebackAlive.ua, which is being hacked currently, is hacked by Russians, sadly, is also among my, my favorites. So, yeah, this is a fun, fun event. Also, what's happened is that, um, well, in response to the map that was posted by the people in Prague by the Russian opposition side, the Russians have posted their own map, on, it's available on Twitter and everywhere, about how Europe should be decolonized. And they include like a bunch of split up, like the only countries that get to be big are Serbia and Russia, and Serbia and the Russian, the map provided by the Russian officials in, it also includes Bosnia, Croatia, Slovenia, Albania, basically all of previous Yugoslavia, Serbia, and Russia includes includes Finland and all the Baltics and parts of Poland. Everyone else is just split up completely. Well, because that's their response. However, well, I, I've seen this being shared by Western agencies, and they just, you know, they, they just make a fuss about how Spain is split, Italy is split, France is split. No one seems to care about the Baltics. Well, I have to remind them that we are, well, not numerous. There's only like, you know, 2 million Latvians, 3 million Lithuanians, 1 million Estonians living in this region. But there's many more of us in, uh, in foreign countries, and that anyone who wants to spread some false rumors, you better remember that our national hero, like, you know, United States has Batman, I suppose, or Superman. I, I, I really don't know. I'll, I'll be there. But our, our national hero is called Bear Slayer. If you think about the context, it makes perfect sense. Just, just that. And secondly, I read an article on... I think it was the Daily Beast. Uh, I just read so much stuff, and like I said, I haven't slept for a while, about how, Ukra how Ukrainians have lost a bunch of HIMARS ammunition. Again, Russian press press service reports this stuff. I highly, highly think that, um, well, people who follow all these news should stop following, well, Russian press, because they're basically piling lies upon lies upon lies. But... Um, yeah, if you look at ammo stockpiles being blown up, and we have many, many videos from this, because high Mars o'clock has been always happening, and we've seen how, you know, if you blow up an ammo stockpile, then the explosions happen for a day or two or three, like, all the time. And what the Russians actually did is that, is that they uh, blew up a, a kind of a warehouse. Yeah, but 
the thing is, uh, there are there are people in Ukraine who believe Russian propaganda, and they're being paid to reveal this information. And the price, by the way, is hundred euros. You you get a hundred euros or a hundred dollars if you kind of pinpoint the places of the places where Ukrainians keep their stuff, the warehouses. And as Russians can't really have any reconnaissance that deep into enemy territory, then uh, they have to kind of believe these accounts, and they blew up a food storage place. No HIMARS missiles have been, you know, exploded, because, well, for one, we would see, as you would normally with uh, ammo dumps, that uh, this place would have multiple explosions. But no, you can see in videos with this that... um that uh, firefighters are already on the spot, doing everything that they can, that, you know, a bit of you people died, there are no secondary explosions. And this is one of the things that also the Institute for Research of War posted as genuine, which I find a bit odd, because, yeah, if, you, if you'd follow Russian stuff more closely, you would know that this is a food stockpile far from the front and all that stuff. But um, about the frontline updates, well, we we really have some. Well, I chose two sources at this this occasion, and one, of course, is Igor Girkin, who I listened to for two hours and nearly kind of went insane doing that because he's always crazy. And the second one is Oleg Zdanov, who is from the Ukrainian side. Igor Girkin states, quote, Regarding the situation at the front line, at the moment, the two hardest spots are Donetsk front line and the central part of the Kherson front line, along the Ingudets River. At the Donetsk front line, our, that is Russian, forces in two days of the offensive operations achieved tactical successes. The most significant were on the day before yesterday, on the first day of the offensive. They managed to advance in two places, north of Marinka. The Ukrainian armed forces ran away from the mine ventilation shaft and our forces took this defensive position. They also managed to capture a number of field strong points between Krasnogovka and Pesky. A slight advance took place last, near, last night near Adyevka. However, the Ukrainian armed forces' uh, front line is not broken through anywhere. Wedges into enemy's defense are rather shallow, for now at least. Ukrainian armed forces are taking significant losses from mass artillery, fi artillery fire. Our losses, as I'm being told, are significantly less, and this is good. Last night and this morning, the enemy carried out more missile strikes at ammo caches. Facilities near and inside Ilyovask were hit and are detonating. Like I said, this is the part. The ammo dumps are detonating. So uh, any Western source that tells you that Russians hit HIMARS stockpiles, yeah, I've looked at the videos. They're not detonating. Ammo dumps are always detonating. This is not, so... Continuing on. In general, like I said earlier, I'm not expecting serious successes in this direction. The enemy is defending a deep-layered long-term positions, while our infantry is rather numerous to be cutting out deep penetrations after initial successes. They will continue, the Ukrainians that is, slowly gnawing, and our forces will, will gnaw back until they reach continuous buildup, which will be followed by street fights bloody for both sides. Then, Russian forces will have to face another line of defense. At Kherson front line, I have not received confirmations that our forces have fully captured the Vyevka, pro tip, they haven't, and pushed out the Ukrainian forces over the Ingulets river, pro tip, they haven't. In this area, fierce fights continue. The enemy is carrying out artillery and missile strikes at Chakolovo village, deep in our defense, basically of direction, which is likely the nearest operational objective in the Ukrainian offensive. Our artillery and aviation, in turn, are ironing the front and rear enemy facilities. Two days ago, yesterday and today, sporadic shelling of the Russian territory by the enemy artillery continued. Border military units and settlements in the Kursk and Bryansk regions were sub subjected to shelling. No information from other areas. And then he uh, kind of adds, To the questions, why I am not commenting on the mm, liberation, I uh, bet that involves some, some nasty stuff too, of Novoluhansk. I say it is a secondary direction. The enemy abandoned the village after leaving the Ukhlegorsk TPP without stubborn resistance, clearing the resulting tactical bag. Much more important are fights at Bakhmut direction, but in the best case scenario, soon the battles will occur at the outskirts of the city, which were turned into the main defensive line by the enemy. End quote. That's Igor Girkin. Here we have a more Ukrainian perspective, because I believe that this really needs to be told. 
Oleg Zhanov, quote, Generally speaking, the front line is stable. There were no substantial events at the front line on the past day. However, the informational and political situation became more active. Volyn Polesie, Siversk direction, north. Continued shelling at Siversk. At Volyn Polesie direction, the activities and numbers of the Belarusian forces have not changed. Belarusian forces continue attempting air reconnaissance with UAVs without entering Ukrainian airspace. The danger of missile strikes from Belarusian territory remains with a large uh, type of rocket types, including Iskander and S-300 ground-to-ground complexes. Kharkiv direction. No changes. The Russian forces are conducting deterring fights. Ukrainian forces are probing the defensive lines in order to push away the Russians to the state borders. Artillery exchanges. Russians are using aviation, including near Staroslavtov. Slavyansk direction. Shelling, but no active hostilities in the past day. Positional fights. Russian forces now need three to four days to accumulate more fuel and ammunitions before advancing again. Khramatorsk direction. The Russian forces continue shelling the Ukrainian line of defense from all available methods. No active assault operations as of today. Bakhmut direction. Continued shelling some assault operations towards Novoluhansk and Solidar for two days. Ukrainians repelled assault attempts at Vershina and Asimigorya. Artillery skirmishes continue. Avdeyevka, Novtopolyovsky, is a Porozhye direction. Aside from shelling the near Avdeyev, uh, Avdeyevka, the Russians used aviation and conducted airstrikes. Vodyanovka and Pieski, Russian reconnaissance by fire, has failed to open up Ukrainian defenses. Usually book direction. No major changes. Ukrainians continue shelling of the Russian positions of ammo and fuel caches. Which is good. Comment by me. Russians are attempting to set up pontoon crossing over Antonovsky Bridge. Dnieper River is complicated for crossing in this area, so attempts will continue. The pontoon crossing will be destroyed. There are also rumors of a ferry being set up. And about the ferry, as I follow the Russians very closely, they've set up a ferry where they intentionally, by the way, under the bridge, uh, carry over both civilians and military things, so that in case that Ukrainians strike the pontoon bridge or this ferry, there will be civilian losses. It's kind of, you know, it will obviously be a war crime, and Ukrainian side will be guilty of this, but it's a provocation by the Russian side, since Russians are literally putting, like, using civilians as a meat shield over there. Oligno, cutting on, by the way, Oligno has been recaptured by Ukrainian forces. The fire sack at Verkhnipolye remains so far and is, and is being attacked by Ukrainians from Oligno, but there is no clear number of the Russian forces there, no more than 1,000. The Russian forces are conducting assault operations to push away the Ukrainian forces, so far unsuccessfully. In the south, the Russian air defense has been considerably compromised, allowing for the Ukrainian strike aviation to operate strongholds and defensive lines. Locals at Kherson report that the Russian forces began purchasing individual watercraft, such as inflatable mattresses and boats in large numbers. The Black Sea. Three caliber missile carriers remain in the Black Sea. Up to 24 missiles can be fired simultaneously. Shelling of cities. Chuguyev, Kharkiv, Mikolaev. Serious shelling. In Mikolaev, cluster missiles were used to strike a residential area, resulting in at least seven casualties. And here he uh, does something that Gitkin doesn't, which is why I've you know, chosen to pick him up. Information assault. Both the video of the brutal execution of the Russian soldier, this is the one with the castration and then shooting in the, the head, and the Elyanovka prison camp strike, this is the one where Russians struck this prison camp of full of Ukrainian prisoners of war just to blame Ukraine for it. And also Russians were stupid enough to blame HIMARS for it, even though, yeah, that leaves evidence and they have none, <clears throat> are part of the informational attack that's being carried out today. In Ilyanovka, the correspondents were nearby to film the event. This is made to discredit the Ukrainian forces ahead of the Kherson offensive operations. I uh, fully agree here because, well, seems extremely likely. And then, military and political situation. And this is from the Ukrainian perspective. And let me tell you, uh, I've been reading this guy previously, and he is very skeptical about what, uh, for example, Germany is doing. And like I said, I'm very sorry that I'm speaking so quickly, but uh, yeah, otherwise this episode is going to be 40 minutes long, and I just need to keep everything up to date. I don't have time to give this to it. I just need to work. But, um, 
but yeah, they're they're kind of blaming Germany for not doing enough, even though in Germany there are people who are already protesting that Germany is doing way more than expected of them. But um, no, well, they've promised a lot, but so far not much is incoming. It's a weird thing. I want to go and, and research Germany stuff myself personally because the Ukrainian side is a bit paranoid by Germany's help and I really don't know what's going on in Germany's side as well because, well, I have quite a few German listeners. I think it's the fifth most listened country on my show or sixth maybe, something like that. And I want to know what Schultz is doing. What, what's his, what is going on in Schultz's mind? I don't want to say something wrong because then I get a bunch of comments from German listeners. So I'll leave that for later and I'll do some research so that I can tell you about this. Th- that'll probably go to another though. So that's fine. But um, carrying on. Mm. After China and the United States of America made strong statements regarding Taiwan and Nancy Pelosi's visit, the USA have brought their carrier group closer to Chinese shores, including two Chinese destroyers. A call was made between Chinese and American leadership last night to discuss security concerns in the region. Dialogue continues. And you might be wondering, why is this mentioned in Ukrainian news? Well, because we in Eastern Europe are not dumb. We follow the world news. And what's happening there with China and Taiwan? Well... If another big war breaks out, we're kind of screwed. So, obviously, we follow you guys. The topic of the delivery of Iranian UAVs to Russia remains on the agenda. Today, an Iranian transport, Boeing 777, was noticed in Moscow. Previously, it was used to transport weapons. However, it is unlikely that the UAVs would be brought to Moscow. If so, the Western intelligence would already know about this, but the information has not been confirmed. A meeting between Putin and Erdogan is being prepared in Sochi on the August the 5th. The grain issues is most likely to be discussed. Turkey prefers to finalize the deal and receive 25% of the grain to be exported from Ukraine. The Odessa support strike allows Vladimir Putin a stronger position in the negotiations. The city in question is most likely to be an exchange factor in these negotiations. And finally, possibly the Russian Federation will use Karabakh as a negotiations factor, since Azerbaijan is expressing dissatisfaction with regards to Russia's reluctance to fulfill the three-side peace agreement between the Russian Federation, Armenia, and Azerbaijan. According to it, the Russian Federation must disarm all illegal armed formations and remove them from Karabakh area. Apparently, Azerbaijan is accumulating forces to resolve, <coughs> resolve this question with military means. So, what we got today is a blood fest on the border, everywhere else too. This wasn't a good day. I'll be resigning now and going off to sleep. Trying to take care of my mental health, you see. Thanks to everyone who supports me on Patreon. It's patreon.com slash the eastern border. I've heard that some people google up our show by just eastern border but it's like the the eastern border as one word the eastern border the the part is apparently important you can also find us on twitter at eastern underscore border where you could just click the button or you can just go to our homepage, page the eastern border.lv and you know click the donate button over there and if you're listening to the show or on youtube then please be informed that acost is just publishing our shows there and i have no time to read the comment section over there on youtube like uh that's another account and it's all bizarre so basically if you're following me on youtube as everything that we post gets demonetized instantly i get nothing of this and like so a few few of you listen to me there uh just just find a different platform and maybe contact me some other way because i remember about youtube so rarely and youtube is so well porked that it's uh, just a bit bizarre. So, yeah, if you're doing that. Uh, Finally, well, thank you again to everyone. And this is a bit of a long episode. This is why we kind of rushed the last part. I hope it's going to be fine. But we're going to be in New York, me and my girlfriend, in the 5th of August at 2.40 p.m. your time, like New York time. So uh, we're going to be looking at, you know, We'd, we'd like we if you want to meet us maybe for the for the evening if someone could with a car could pick us up in the airport we'll, we'll talk about which airport i think it's i think it's laguardia but i'm not exactly sure so you know just take us to a nice burger place maybe to a burger place where they also have beer that'd be nice but um 
we're going to be staying at uh, our listener James's place. But I kind of don't know when he gets back from work, so we're going to have some time and maybe we can like all hang out in the evening. I promise souvenirs. So that's about it. And uh, I'll try to respond to everyone, but my notifications are overloaded right now and uh, I oftentimes work way more than expected and way more than I should because, you know, I live on a day-by-day basis. It is what it is. <sighs> Trying to do my best. Hopefully you gain something from this episode because, again, the front part was a bit rushed, but hey, otherwise I wouldn't be able to fit this in, say, 30 minutes. It's already longer. I expect these episodes as I release them way more than my regular ones to be a bit shorter, but hey, again, it is what it is. До свидания, товарищи. And remember, happiness is mandatory.